Good morning and uh, welcome back and welcome to this exciting uh, session Tower for Aortic Regurgitation. Uh, it's a sponsored session by Jena Valve and it features the Jena Valve uh, Trilogy uh, system, of course. My name is Andreas Baumbach. I'm an interventional cardiologist here in London. Here in England, we didn't have access to that system. Uh, it was uh, reserved for the select few in other countries, but we're looking forward to sharing the experience and seeing uh, what can be uh, achieved with that. We'll have a deep dive into aortic regurgitation, the natural history and the clinical reality of it, uh, really. Uh, we finish this uh, swift session of 45 minutes uh, with a fantastic live recorded case. In the studio with me, the moderator is Nicolas van Amigem. We've got Matty Adam. Uh, from Köln, we've got Tanja Rudolph uh, from Bad Oeynhausen, Torstenwall, uh, New York, and the procedural analyst on the smart screen will be Hendrik Trede, uh, surgeon in Mainz in Germany. We will have the opportunity to ask questions. Now, how does that work? Yeah, so I can imagine that the audience will have quite some questions because we are exploring new territories for TAVI, aortic regurgitation, and we will illustrate fascinating technology to treat uh, aortic regurgitation. So if you have questions, please use the chat function also online and hear present, the people present in the audience. And we have Alex Stem in Mainz who will also uh, deal with the questions and some of the questions will be reverted back to us and then we can also handle the questions in the, with the panel. Fantastic. Let's get going. We only have 45 minutes. Tanya, will you please tell us uh, why aortic regurgitation? So these are my disclosures um, and um, I think what you all are aware of is the fact that if we have a patient with aortic regurgitation, there is a volume and pressure overload on the left ventricle, and it comes to compensatory, but eventual already detrimental structural changes on the left ventricle. And during this time, uh, the patient is still asymptomatic, so usually he's not seeing a doctor because he does not have any symptoms. And then at one point, there is a drop in LV function, and the patient usually becomes symptomatic. So what is really absolutely key um, in aortic regurgitation is um, echocardiography. Um, there are clear parameters uh, given to us from the um, ESC and ESCTS guidelines um, who help us to actually grade uh, aortic regurgitation correctly. There are qualitative parameters as the valve morphology and the flow reversal in the descending aorta. There are semi-quantitative uh, parameters as the pressure half time and the vena contractor. And then of course we should also assess uh, quantitative measures as the regurgitation uh, volume and the ROA. I think as you all are aware of, this does not, uh, this is not possible in all the patients we are seeing. Sometimes we are struggling to measure these parameters and, and, and I think we should definitely make a further step. If the echo is not conclusive in a patient, we should move on with the MRI. Um, so what we know already for more than 20 years is that uh, severe aortic regurgitation is potentially life-threatening for our patient. So the mortality per year is about 4.7% in, in patients who are uh, still asymptomatic. And as soon as they become symptomatic, the mortality increases to 9.4%. And when they are highly symptomatic, it's almost up to 25% per year. So when you have a patient who has severe aortic regurgitation and he's symptomatic, he is classified according to the ACC AHA guidelines in the uh, stage D of chronic stages of aortic regurgitation. And here it's pretty easy um, when you think about what you should do with this patient. Of course, he should uh, undergo timely intervention. So there's a, a class one indication in the ACC and AHA guidelines for a patient with severe symptomatic aortic regurgitation. 
Uh, but I mentioned before that we have asymptomatic patients um, with severe aortic regurgitation, and they are, there is already uh, structural changings going on in the left ventricle. But we just miss them when we just ask for the symptoms. And um, more um, recent trials have clearly shown that left ventricular function is a clear predictor of survival. So when left ventricular function um, declines below 55 percent, the um, outcome is worse in our patients, and it's the same with the dimensions of the left ventricle. So if the left ventricular and systolic diameter increases, and we index that to the body surface area, then this also indicates a worse survival rate in our patients. So it's definitely also important that we not only assess the severity of the aortic regurgitation, but that we also assess the left ventricle. And here we have a 73-year-old patient, male, who presented asymptomatically at our heart valve clinic, and he has an ejection fraction of 52, already um, dilatation of the left ventricle, and he also has a reduced uh, global longitudinal strain. So he would be classified in uh, stage C uh, according to the ACC AHA guidelines. And here are also clear um, uh, instructions from the ACC AHA and ESC guidelines what we should do here. And uh, you can see that here in the middle. So if there's an asymptomatic patient in stage C and the ejection fraction is below 55, it's a class 1 indication that the patient undergoes aortic valve replacement. Um, if the ejection fraction uh, is, uh, is, is not reduced below 55, but the ventricle is already dilated, it's a class 2A indication. And if the um, uh, ejection fraction is still normal, but there is an enormous uh, dilatation or it's, it's, a, it's a severe progress within a few months, then it's a 2B indication. And this is very similar to the ESC guidelines. Um, if you have a patient who is asymptomatic and there is no uh, dilatation and the LV function is still okay, then you should uh, follow up on him closely. You should see the patient every 6 to 12 months. And as soon as you see a dilatation of the left ventricle, the interval should be um, smaller and you should see the patient every 3 to 6 months. So um, I would like to summarize. The aortic regurgitation is really a life-threatening disease and our patient mortality is high as soon as the patient gets symptomatic, and then we have a clear class 1 recommendation uh, that the patient should undergo surgical valve replacement. But I think what is even more important that we look for the patient who is still asymptomatic and uh, displays left ventricular dysfunction or dilatation. There is also clear recommendations that we should treat these patients as well. And echo is absolutely key to diagnose and also to track the patients and the LV function. And so uh, to conclude, close follow-up and early intervention, in my opinion, is absolutely key for long-time survival, survival of our patients. Thank you. Th thank you very much, uh, Tanya. Nicolas, the there's lots of questions now, of yeah, course. Uh, yeah. So I think it's fair to say that aortic regurgitation poses a conundrum, a clinical conundrum. And then maybe the first question for Hendrik as a surgeon, the phenotype of a patient with severe aortic regurgitation, is that different from, for instance, severe aortic stenosis? Are we talking about a different kind of patient? Uh, well, the disease is a completely different one, so yes, it's a, it's a slightly different phenotype. Um, in surgery, the, those patients we see, they divide up into two groups. One have severe AR, but they have healthy valves and they have root pathologies. So, of course, then you do valve sparing root replacement. But here we talk more about those patients who have a valve disease. And they, um, when they come to surgery or being sent to surgery, are more or less in more healthy states. So they have somehow preserved ventricular function, they are not this old. The list of comorbidities is not this long. So these are the patients that we got for surgery, but we know oh, there are many more out who are not being referred for surgery. Yeah, so, so are we under-treating then or under-diagnosing these patients? Is that what you're suggesting? I would say yes, yeah. I know what, what your opinion is, but I, I think definitely yes. I think the, there is an important interaction required between uh, interventionalists, surgeons, and the imager, of course. And I think there is sometimes a disconnect between uh, the diagnosis made by the imager and then the referral for a or a consideration for a procedure. Torsten, is this also what you experience that often, oftentimes these patients are referred a little bit too late in their process? Yeah, I, I have the feeling in, in the US as well that 
that we um, are under-referring uh, these patients. They're sort of seen by the general cardiologist. They get an echo, but because they're often not symptomatic yet, and uh, as Professor Rudolph was just pointing out, the, the, there is often obviously recent data that suggests that we should be more aggressive and not wait for the ejection fraction to drop as much, not for the ventricles to dilate as much. And I think that has not translated into our practice yet. Um, it's often underestimated which impact this disease has on the patient's mm -hmm. long term. Yeah, and I think what, what Tanya also clearly illustrated was the importance of LV dilatation and LV function, because if, a ventricle that has been exposed to severe aortic regurgitation has a lot of volume overload, and that's a different animal than pressure overload. So, Mati, a question for you then. Would you feel comfortable treating an asymptomatic uh, patient with severe aortic stenosis uh, and, for instance, do a TAVR if the operative risk would be excessive? I mean, that's a great question. So I think, um, first of all, um, that we really need to be sure that the um, aortic regurgitation is severe. So I think that uh, imaging is really important in these cases. So um, because it's not only a, it's not one measurement. It's not a mean gradient of over 40. It is really difficult um, to really characterize AR. But if the AR is severe um, and the patient is absolutely asymptomatic, LV function is perfectly normal. I mean, then then you're out of the guidelines right now, right? But if you I mean, look closer, maybe look for strain analysis, as Tanya showed in her picture uh, or in, in her slides, and then and, and get a feeling of um, if this ventricle really is um, under a volume overload, as you said. I think that would give me good arguments to achieving that goal to treating that patient, especially having that prognosis in mind. Um, that I think I, there would be arguments to do that earlier, right? Mm -hmm. still think we need to understand it better. Um, but but I feel that we're, as Hendrik said, we're under-treating these patients. Yeah, and obviously if you would consider a patient for a percutaneous treatment, you, you do want to have the proper technology to do that, of, obviously, Absolutely. because a lot of those patients, they don't have the calcium to anchor the conventional uh, valves. Did, uh, Tanya, maybe a final question for you then on that particular topic. Is that an issue with contemporary valve platforms for, to treat aortic regurgitation, the fact that there is hardly any calcium involved? Yeah, for sure. I mean, of course, we had these um, patients in our centers um, over the last years where the Trilogy valve was not available. So we had to treat some patients with severe AR who were not eligible for surgery. And of course, we were using the other available usual TAVI devices, but uh, there was always a payoff in some patients. And I think you all know that um, you have to have some oversizing to be sure that the valve is properly anchored. And of course, there is an increased risk then for permanent pacemaker implantation, and uh, you might have a migration of the valve. So these are all issues you have to consider. Um, if you really want to treat this patient. And I think then, um, I think we were more reluctant and, and we did not treat patient um, in regard of prognosis, so more the symptomatic ones, at least in our center. Mm -hmm. And so I think if you, if you want to treat patient for prognostic reasons, you have to be sure that you offer them a valve or a system that is actually really fulfilling the purposes. Yeah. So the question arises, is there an unmet need? Exactly. <laughs> and in order to clarify that, I'm going to interview Hendrik Trade, and I'm going to go over to the smart screen. This is a little experiment. Um, Hendrik, <laughs> let's look into numbers now, yeah. because we've been talking about we feel that we undertreat, we feel that we don't refer the patients. What do we actually know about the treatment of aortic regurgitation? Yeah, the good message is, Andreas, that uh, the treatment is life-saving. So we have very good data on surgery, and if you look at these two curves here, those being patients uh, up operated for AR and those being patients left untreated or just best medical treatment, there's a dramatic difference in survival. Okay. So there is a cure, um, at least we know from surgery, uh, that we can help these patients a lot. So this, I assume, is elective surgery. How about patients that are sicker? How about the ones that we see that come in yeah. and it has been left too long and now they, you know, they decompensate and they're not in a good state. Also what very good point, Andres. The thing is that this is taken then as an argument not to send patients for surgery because the uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is down low. But even if you do surgery then, we have very good data showing that the same effect is happening in these patients who have uh, reduced LV function 
again, this is operated patients, this is non-operated patients, and there still is a dramatic survival difference. And if you, if you just look at the perspective of patients, if you let them untreat, uh, untreated, uh, the first year mortality is just amazingly high. So you can really uh, save lives if you do that uh, yeah. treatment, yeah. even those patients. But what happens more often than not is that those patients are just declared too far gone and are not operated. I, exactly. I, I think the figure is 25% is treated yeah. of all the aortic regurgitations with an indication. So where are the 75%? Where, you know, what happens to those patients? Do we have any data on those and how many there are? Yeah, yeah we have data from the US and we also have data from the European Heart Survey. Let's start with the US data again. If you look at uh, the experience in the US and compare all patients, then divided by the various LV function groups, the survival difference of treated and versus untreated is still dramatic, and it's getting even more dramatic the, the lower the EF is. So in those with somehow preserved ejection fraction, there is a difference, but it's not as dramatic as the difference in survival when mm -hmm. it comes to lower ejection fraction. So this is, uh, of course, very important. But uh, we just speak about those patients who are being treated, and you ask yourself, so who's not treated, basically? Exactly. And if you look at that, you will find out, okay, who's not treated? These are the older patients, huh? age 80 plus, very rare What's that chance. Eight, 80 plus 80 is not. 80 plus, yeah. yeah it's very, I, I have to apologize for small numbers. So this is age 80 plus, very low chance of getting treatment. And then ejection fraction, as we, as we said, you know, the worse the ejection fraction is, the less chance you have of getting a treatment. And then, of course, frailty and all the other measures. You know, if you have a high frailty score, then, of course, it's less likely to get a treatment. So this was to be expected somehow. So the elderly patients at high risk with low ejection fraction, those are the ones who do not get surgical so treatment. Basically, you know, the reverse is we, we choose and pick the one that, that we think will do well, yeah. um, uh, as always. And we don't have any treatment for the others. Yeah, not right. yet, at least, right. Yeah. And there's also, to take this away now, there's also data, of course, uh, from Europe. Um, you know the European Heart Survey that was published way beyond, yes. um, I think, 2001, the first one. There's a new one now being published by Bernard Young. And this shows us that, um, that uh, the percentage of patients treated is very low. Actually, we have to follow this line, the aortic regurgitation just of the total population that. Yeah. In, that, in, that, uh, in that survey was just 10%. But only 10% of those patients um, who had that were, um, um, were underwent in intervention. And that accounted for like 26% of those who showed up with CVAR got a treatment. Only 26%. So 75% did not, even in that more recent so, published yeah. uh, European Heart Survey. OK. Well, there is a need, it seems. Here are different numbers from that same survey. Have you got survey. any more information for us? Well, it's. Uh, it's basically the same, um, a smaller group of patients being treated, only 33% underwent um, uh, um, uh, treatment here. So it's, it's all the, wherever you look, it's all the same. You know, it's just about 25 to 30% to getting treatment. Okay. Thank you You're welcome. very much. I think we clarify it now, Nicolas. There is an unmet need. Now the question is what we do with that. Yeah. Well, um, so, all right, you guys join us again. So then the first question still for Hendrik. So you see that there is this disconnect under treatment of patients with uh, severe aortic mm. regurgitation and predominantly the patients who are elderly and have a depressed LV function. For you as a surgeon, are those real reasons not to operate age and LV function? No. Um of course, you finally have a look at the patient, and, um, and then you find out these are uh, surgical candidates. But we have to accept that there is a certain risk with having heart-lung machine open-heart operations, even if you do that minimally invasively. The, the risk is higher, that we have to be honest. So there's, in my eyes, there's a clear need for interventional treatment. But if, um, if, uh, if we are in a situation where there's no treatment option, then I would rather go for surgery than letting patients die. Yeah, and, and that, is, that is a clear reality because some people are really not good transcatheter candidates, right? If you also have a dilated ascending aorta or the, the valve size is too large for a percutaneous valve, then yeah. basically the only solution would end up being uh, a, uh, a surgical intervention. So, Matti, is this something that you often... Uh, come across that the valve is also large, the anatomy? Um, yes, of course. I mean, given the, the pathobiology of that disease, um, if it's a dilation of the root and then therefore dilation uh, of the aortic valve itself, and then 
if that's the mechanism of aortic, aortic regurgitation, then of course we have patients right now that would not fit uh, an, interventional, um, an interventional treatment because we have limited valve size <coughs> right now and if, um, if you're above 27, then 27 millimeters of diameter, then I think um, it's really challenging. Um, so, yeah, I think we still can evolve a little bit, um, but right now, I mean, there's a significant group of patients that I think that would fit the valve sizes we have right now. Mm -hmm. And Thorsten, you've treated quite an, a significant number of patients with aortic regurgitation, I assume with different technologies. Um, what is the major limitation of contemporary uh, transcatheter platforms to treat aortic regurgitation? Yeah, I mean, as was pointed out before, the, the main challenge in, in pure aortic regurgitation is that we don't have the calcium available that we usually for anchoring, use for anchoring of our tablet devices. So device migration, uh, increased rates of, of paravalvular leak, and in the worst cases, device embolizations are just more frequent, which explains why the mortality rate of about 10, 12 percent um, uh, at 30 days is observed with contemporary devices, which is much, much higher than what we see with TAVR in, in aortic stenosis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Tanya, do you have experience with, um, with these devices in aortic regurgitation, and do you also recognize that the, the stakes are higher in these patients, that the procedural risk is higher? Well, I would say the one we treated um, interventionally were per se at high risk. They were not good surgical candidates. So there, I think it's a special selection in these kind of mm -hmm. patients. So they are not completely comparable to the patients we now use to treat when they have an AS. Um, so that might be the reason also why we see um, higher mortality rates in hospital and also after 30 days and six months. Um, but it might also have to do something uh, with the LV um, changes we, we encounter, as you mentioned before, that the volume overload is maybe something that is more detrimental to the left ventricle as the pressure overload. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one other reason is that usually we see the patients at a very late stage. I mean, this is something we also encountered 10 years ago, where we also saw aortic stenosis patients at a very late yeah. state. So this changed over time since we have now different treatment uh, options available. And, and I hope that this is also will, will taking place somehow with patients with AR, that mm -hmm. we are not so restrictive in, in send them for treatment earlier since we have more opportunities to treat yeah. them. Well, I think one of the conclusions should be that uh, at this day and age for uh, aortic regurgitation, a transcatheter option should be reserved only for the high or inoperable patients. Inoperable patients are patients at a high operative risk. But and for, uh, but fortunately, there is new technology, and there is technology that relies on a different concept of anchoring. And I think, uh, Andreas, we have a recorded case to demonstrate that. Perfect lead-in. <laughs> so now is the time for the recorded case, and uh, it's a pleasure. Maddy, Maddy Adams will, will talk us through the case and uh, present. Yeah, thank you. So that's a case we recorded uh, in Cologne, and I think we're just going to run here from the hybrid OR. Heart yeah, and um, we, we let it run, and I'll give you some insights today, in between, okay? Uh, live case on implantation of a Genovelve transfemoral prosthesis in a patient with pure aortic regurgitation. To do this, uh, we have obviously the team available here. To my right, it's uh, Marty Adam, head of the program here from um, the cardiology clinic. We have Dr. Ekbal Zade from cardiac surgery. We have Sebastian, who's helping us out at the table. We have Dr. Ecker from anesthesiology and Dr. Kerber, who's giving us uh, pictures by TOE. So as I just mentioned, we're going to treat the patient with aortic regurgitation. Perhaps, Matti, you can present the patient to us. Yeah, so we have an 83-year-old um, male patient here today who has come to our department with uh, dyspnea, with progressive dyspnea, uh, on the level of uh, Nihar class 2 to 3. Um, in the echocardiography, we found a relevant and uh, severe aortic regurgitation um, due to the age and the cardiac comorbidities, which are a three-vessel disease and for, uh, also, very importantly, a, a very impaired renal function, um, as well as the presentation um, of the patient with frailty. We decided in the heart team to treat the patient interventionally, um, and that's where, um, uh, where we discussed the implantation of a Hina valve. 
So what we want to do now is we want to prepare the groin, want to insert a sheath, and then show you along the way how this procedure is done. I mean, you could see um, that this was a mixed disease, right? So uh, there was not 80% LVOT uh, jet, but it was uh, two very big convergent zones. Uh, ERA was 0.4, so there was a classical mixed disease. You see STJs, not, you know, it's dilated, so you don't have that uh, typical STJ. So we formation. finished the first step of the procedure. We, as you have seen, inserted the sheath on the left femoral side just for diagnostic purposes and we injected uh, basically into the root to visualize severe aortic regurgitation. Now we changed this, exchanged this uh, to a multipurpose catheter which will help us um, uh, later on to visualize uh, the cusps uh, and at the, on the other side prevents entanglement with the valve. You will see this in a minute. Here on this side, on the right side, we inserted an 18 French sheath for preparation of insertion of the valve, put forward the pigtail catheter into the left ventricle. We now have to wait for an ACT of 250. This is pretty important uh, in case of implantation of a Jenner valve. Yeah, I mean, that Stefan pointed out already, so that, that's a big sheath you put in that patient, right? It's long, and you want to make sure that okay, your ACT is high. Okay, now we have inserted uh, the safari via into the left ventricle. Other than and that, it's a standard setup, basically, two proglides um, and then an 18 French sheath, and then you insert the big sheath. There it is. Um, and I mean, uh, we, I think we can discuss on the panel if you think that the sheath is a pro or a contra, but um, I mean, it's a long sheath um, that you will advance until you reach the STJ or almost reach the STJ. I think once it's there, it might actually give you stability uh, and also protection when you cross the system yeah. around the arch. But that's an interesting concept. You know, yeah, I, I mean, but that's, that's so it unique. gives you a lot of stability. It's, it's, I mean, it is something different, right? Um, but you see now we, we get okay. the dilator back and the sheath stays in place. And it will, it will house um, the three locators, which are the main treat of that valve, let's say. Uh, you'll see that in a second. How does that work in tortuous arteries? Uh, actually, I mean, we usually um, insert that over a safari wire. Here you see the sorry. Here you see the three locators, which are now um, they're, they're put in place by that uh, introduction sh uh, help uh, sheath thing. And now once you put that in uh, in the sheath, the locators are basically only hold by the sheath. So once the valve comes out in front of the sheath, then the locators start to spread out. Um, I mean, advancing now, the system advancing the system now. Um, I never experienced problems there. Um, it might, still might be challenging, so you might want to look uh, really closely at your aortic uh, arch anatomy. Um, and for now, we have uh, only used safari wires in our center, so we don't even need a stiffer wire to put that sheath there. So, uh, but I think it's a screening issue, right? You really need to take care of your anatomy. So now we retract the sheath, um, and you see the locators will separate. And then the aim is to put these three separators into the nadir of each cusp. So you see, sheath goes uh -huh. back into the descending aorta, and uh, you'll see separation of these three locators. Now you can flex the system which you, with that blue knob there, and um, then uh, you can also separate the delivery part of that stiffer part from the delivery system, so you'll have more um, mobility, and you can rotate and actually advance or retract um, the valve. According to its anatomical position, we want to aim at. Yes, sir. That's perfect. So we're advancing the system, and of course, you need to make sure that your locators are in the right position. And you see now, there's one locator in the left, one in the non, and the one in the middle. You're not quite sure where that could be, right? It could be in front, or it could be in the back, mm -hmm. but it, not, it needs to be in front. So um, what we're going to do now is a C-arm sweep. And you see that the middle locator moves towards the non-coronary cusp. And that's actually indicating that we are in the wrong position. So um, that means that the locator is posterior, right? So if you rotate like that and it moves to your non-coronary, that's actually not correctly positioned. So what we did is we retracted um, the valve a little bit. And you see now we're turning that knob again. We're rotating and bringing that middle locator in the front position. Using the locators mm -hmm. as landmarks. OK, we'll do this again. Then you can advance again. And 
we do that CR sweep, and you see now the middle locator moves towards the left if you do LAO to RAO, mm -hmm. um, and, and that means, okay, it's in front. So now you can um, advance the system. You see that the, separate, that the locators will separate and start a little bit of dancing. So you, you see now the left uh, really is taking up contact with the anatomy. Um, and I think now it, it looks basically not too, um, not too bad. So we should uh, use a puff of contrast there. See, So you see non coronary locator is definitely in the non coronary cusp. It's a three cusp view, yeah. Yeah, that's a three cusp view, exactly. And you saw left and uh, right are also engaging with the anatomy. Ceiling ring is at the annular level, so um, maybe it ends a little bit more and then uh, release the valve. Yeah, that's fine. And now we have for real yeah. So you get tactile feeling there? Yeah, so it's not so much of a haptic feedback for me right now, so it's more visual, but um, yeah, you, I mean, you want to make sure that you're in contact with the anatomy. And for this case, we actually, um, we, we did TOE to make sure that the locators are in place. Uh, I don't think that's absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if we move forward, I really would love to have that only in very special cases or mm -hmm. for graduation of um, PVL afterwards. Um, but here, of course, it was... Uh, and with that long sheet, probably the torque transmission is quite good? It is actually because of pretty the long good. Sheet, right? I mean, yeah. over the development of the systems, it got better and better, and right now it's, it's, it's pretty good. And with this concept, you immediately get commercial alignment for free, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's what I, I mean, yeah, that's a great point, because you okay. absolutely so have commercial alignment. Now we deploy the valve, so it's a, a, a turn-click mechanism on the, on the back end of the system, and you'll see that um, uh, the stand holder in the distal, in the ventricular part, moves Oops. forward, and then um, also the stent holder in the proximal part uh, moves backwards. Um, so the valve, then self-expanding valve, obviously, is released. Now you put everything back into position and, uh, and retract the system in, inside the long sheath, which is still staying in the descending, and then, then you're basically done. Well, it's a very nice demonstration of, of some of these nuances that this te technology has. As you pointed out, obviously the locators are one of the key features that, that help us to position these, this valve and clip onto the leaflets. Yeah. They help us to achieve the commissural alignment, but they also have created the requirement for the long sheath for now because the long sheath protects the aortic, um, the aorta from, from the locators as they are being uh, brought across the arch. Uh, very nice demonstration with this case. Thank you very much. I mean, that was a great uh, demonstration. And I, I think I have to read it out. The first operator was Stefan Baldus, who unfortunately couldn't be yeah, here with us. Absolutely. He was supposed to do what I'm doing right now. Um, so I think we haven't really shown the mechanism. This is a clip-on, right? Exactly. So you have three locators, and these locators will then um, fall into the, the cusps, and when the ceiling ring is actually released, then it will clip like a, yeah, really like a clip and hold the, the cusp inside. And that's why it's really, really good for larger valves and uh, aortic regurgitation without any calcium. So, how stable is this? And do you, do you expect migration? Is that still possible after you have clipped to the leaflets, Henrik? No. No, no. Once the valve is in place, it's it's barely impossible to move it uh, unless you deploy it in the wrong position um, by first hand. Then otherwise, it will not migrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, Torsten, you are obviously part of the of the U.S. trial that is still still ongoing. Um, do you have some insights that you can share? What is the status? What is your initial feel about it? Um, well, in in the U.S., we are now in in the process of moving over to a PMA trial. Um, so the, the early feasibility study um, has been completed and it's currently being rolled over and 180 patients are going to be enrolled in this study to achieve approval in the U.S. Obviously, you have gotten CE mark uh, approval here in, here in Europe now for, for this device, which uh, provides a new opportunity for the treatment um, 
of these patients. Um, to the clipping mechanism point, one of the things that we also liked early on, uh, we had some opportunity to treat some AS patients as part of the trial, and that also provides an opportunity um, for low coronaries. Because you're clipping the leaflets away from the coronary ostea, uh, it, this technology also has, <coughs> has an advantage in AS patients with low-lying uh, coronary arteries. Mm -hmm. can, you, can I just chip in there and, and, and ask a question? I, I've seen the presentation about the low coronaries. But with the clipping mechanism, does that not, is there a problem if you have heavy calcification, if you have really big leaflets heavily calcified? Or does this work anyway? I mean, we've obviously we have a limited experience at this point, but with uh, good pre dilation, we've um, treated many, many patients with um, you know, severe coronary artery disease with high calcium burdens with, without uh, uh, problems. problems. Yeah. Uh, from a conceptual point of view, Tanya, would you, would you consider this valve also for aortic stenosis? Yes, and we actually do that already. So we were also able to use the Trilogy system in our center. So we have done uh, seven commercial cases and have done two in the trial. So, and also from the former experience, um, it's not a problem to use it in AS. And I think it's definitely an option for patients with severe coronary artery disease where you want to make sure that you are definitely able to reassess access the coronaries after a TAVI implantation. So not only for low coronaries, but also in patients where you just want to be sure that you will be able to uh, access the coronaries. Mm -hmm. And as you are clipping to the, to the native leaflets, how does that valve translate towards paravalvular leak? Is that an issue with this uh, with trilogy or not? So, so far, of course, it's a limited experience, um, but, but we used it in, in patients with um, high calcium burden. Um, and there was, um, when we did a pre-dilatation, as you mentioned, there was no problem regarding paravalvular leak. I remember one case where we had to do a post-dilatation to really make sure that the valve opening was opening completely, but um, there was no bigger issue mm -hmm. on that. So, so in this day and age, uh, a, a TAVR procedure takes 45 minutes under local anesthesia. It's a very straightforward procedure. Mm -hmm. Is this something, is Trilogy also a device that you could use in that context, Hendrik? Yeah, you can. We skipped uh, the TE already. Um, mm -hmm. So we were supposed to do it within the study setting, but now with CE mark, we skipped the TE. It's very good. You have seen that you can, with contrast, you can display all three sinuses as well, yeah. and then you are sure that you're in good position, can release the valve without TE. So the last patients we did were, were awake, as we usually do, and, and that is possible. Mm -hmm. It still is a longer procedure than an Evolute or a Sapien 3. We have to be honest, because you have to take care that you align the <laughs> locators and bring everything in perfect position, and that takes a bit longer time. Yeah. But I think it's worth the effort. Uh, because there are some more advantages we haven't talked about. You were asking for a seal. I think seal is even better with that valve because you take the leaflets as another yeah. part of the seal. Mm -hmm. And then also you can never have this valve too deep or too high. You can just implant it in the correct position. And that also has a positive impact on pacemaker rates. And actually the pacemaker rates, if, if I might say, in the aortic stenosis population has been the lowest I've ever seen. So because, you know, there's not much radial force in the lower stand part. And still you get all the advantages. There is a question uh, from, from the chat uh, in terms of sizing. What is the sizing matrix, Thorsten? How, how large anatomies can you treat? So it's mostly, mostly oriented on the perimeter, like for most uh, uh, self-expanding valves. And um, in the IFU, we can treat up to uh, 85 millimeter perimeter. Clinically, we've, we've gone um, on some compassionate use cases and also with some exemptions in the trial to 90, 92 millimeters perimeter mm -hmm. and, and still with very good success. Once you sort of go north of 92, you will get some commissural leaks. And uh, I think that's where the limit is right now. No question, we will need one larger valve size. As you all pointed out, many of these patients have larger roots and sometimes uh, uh, larger annuli than that. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe one, one final question, Mati. Um, is there an issue of embolization and would you sometimes need rapid pacing for the deployment? Uh, very good question. I mean, so usually we do fast pacing for deployment of the valve just to be sure that, you know, we're kind of used to it now. So I think it's a procedural safety mechanism. Uh, what is that fa fast pacing? Fast pacing 120? 120, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I don't, and I mean, if you like, I would suggest like if you have a really calcified valve and you really, and, and 
you know, your locators are still in contact with the calcium, you're not super low, then I, I would see that as a situation where you might want to use faster pacing to get the forward load of the ventricle uh, out of the equation. Um, but usually it's, um, I mean, you should be sure that you're very well seated before you release the valve, and then I think um, embolization is really, should not be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, that's what we experience. And so Thank and you I very think, much. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. And I, well, I just, the procedure times, I absolutely agree with Hendrik. I mean, procedure times um, is really a learning curve. And, and once you figure out that mechanism, yeah, as always. But uh, a couple of more minutes of investment doesn't matter, right? If you, if yeah. you obtain then commissural alignment, you, have coron you preserve your coronary access, you have a proper exactly. seal. It's yeah. A couple of minutes exactly. is worth it, right? I mean, absolutely. alignment also needs a little bit more time with other companies. So yeah. if yeah. you have that, I think that's an advantage. Intriguing. Fantastic. I'm sure there's well, several people in the audience thinking I've got a patient for that. And um, this is a new treatment opportunity for us. It's fantastic. Key learnings. What have we learned uh, through those uh, 45 minutes? I made a couple of notes. Uh, first, back to excellent talk. Echocardiography is still the key uh, in diagnosing and quantifying the severity. And we've got guidelines that say class 1A for surgical intervention. But there is an unmet uh, clinical need. Only 26% of patients are actually uh, treated, and uh, there is no real option for the higher risk uh, patient, and we, we desperately need a percutaneous, uh, good uh, interventional option. And now we have uh, seen a demonstration of new technology. It's very promising. It's not exclusively for AR, but also a good valve. Uh, to treat uh, aortic uh, stenosis. That was my summary. With that, I thank everybody, panel. Thank you very much. That was really exciting. And everybody here, and I think it's now time for a break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.